very much for coming along to Sluice 2015. This is the third Sluice in London. The third Sluice Art Fair, which starts in 2011. We did it by Last year we did it as a collaboration with Galleries in New York, in Bushwick, Brooklyn. So we have a, uh, we're an open entity, not just an art fair, but also a place for discussion conversation and that's really what the talks program is all about. So we've had a full uh, quota of talks today, yesterday and the day before and we will continue to do that. Sluice began as a platform for artists run initiatives and so we love programs where we get to hear from practicing artists and that's what we have today which is really exciting. One thing I should say is that everything we do is free for anyone who wants to attend and that's an important part of what we do. It does mean that we need some kind of financial help from someone, for the love of God. So if you, uh, if you want to help us out, um, buy a magazine downstairs, it's five pounds, it's full of fantastic articles and descriptions of all the participating projects and galleries, it's really worth it. So I'd buy a t-shirt as well, why not go to town, buy some art, for, why not, eh? buy some art. There's plenty there. That as well is also good, so please do that to support us and help us uh, not destroy it. Not um, to kind of carry on and not uh, leave it in the shell. So, um, Sluice closes at six tonight. There's lots more to see, and there's more, even another talk happening after this one. But I want to introduce this talk just before I do. We record all of our talks. So, if you're interested in seeing this talk again, or interested in seeing any of our previous talks, we've had talks about uh, um, art criticism, talks about the nature of art fairs, talks about all kinds of things, they're all archived and they're all on our website which is sluice.info. So have a look over there and have a look through them if you'd like to. Um, that's all I'm going to say. I want to hand over to our speakers who are going to be talking about abstract revival, however you choose to define that. I'm okay. uh, very interested in hearing about it. We have Piers Vaness, who is shown here with Square Art Projects just through here. We have Juan Bolivar. I'm going to let you all introduce yourselves individually as well. And uh, of course, Enrico Gomez, who is showing the Piers uh, in the space just through the doorways through there. That's all I'm going to say. Great. Good luck. Interested. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so maybe we should say who we are <coughs> first. Hi, um, I'm Piers Vaness. Uh, first and foremost, I'm an abstract painter uh, and I also co direct Square Art Projects, which is a, an artist run project here in London. Uh, um, yes, I'm one Bolivar. I make paintings, I create exhibitions, and also a co director of Turk's uh, Gallery in London. Uh, hi, I'm Enrico Gomez. I am an abstract <laughs> painter as well. Um, in addition to that, I um, am an independent curator. My project is the Dorado Project. It started last year. Uh, before that, I um, co ran a alternative art space called. Uh, parallel art space, and so um, we showed a lot of um, abstract work, uh, sculpture, uh, painting, and, and the like for about three years in Brooklyn. Um, and then I also am a writer. I write for Wagmag, a Brooklyn art guide, and S Art and Opinions occasionally out of Montreal. Great. Great. Um, well, just to kind of explain kind of the, the idea behind this talk, um, something that we've noticed recently is that seems that abstract painting's having a bit of a revival at the moment. We just wanted to think about why that might be. Um, so I think, uh, and also I was just reading off my notes, um, there's a really good um, uh, essay on this by a, a guy called David Gears from October magazine from 2012. Um, and he wrote a lot about this kind of resurgence of abstract painting, particularly from uh, a New York perspective. Um, and so I've kind of pulled up some of the ideas from there as well that we can talk about. So maybe the first slide. Okay, cool. Uh, so this is John Hoyland, uh, an abstract British painter who I think died in 2011. Um, I just started with this because this is um, the first show of Damien Hirst's new space is John Hoyland and I think that's quite kind of pertinent to what we're talking about is that his first show is actually abstract painting. Um, so I think one of the things I'd like to start off maybe is thinking about um, this idea of, of the human kind of human hand involved in 
in, in abstract painting, um, and particularly compared to the next slide, this kind of work that I think we see all around the world is very kind of highly finished. This is um, Mark Quinn uh, from 2013. These very kind of highly finished pieces of art that we see a lot of, you know, in, in the blue chip galleries. And I, I'd like to talk, start to talk about why um, perhaps abstract painting is kind of against this in some kind of way. I, I, I if I could just, um, I'll start and then, because uh, I have a small thing to say that I think that, um, not that I want to take the conversation too much into, in, uh, into economics, but one of the points that came up in earlier conversations, uh, keep it on art, but there is an inevitable overlap uh, with any painter emerging, particularly emerging artists, um, not just painters, but um, in any city, particularly metropolitan areas, London, New York, Los Angeles, um, that economics is a factor, and that while I'm going to speak based, I'm based in the New York environs, I don't attempt to speak for every emerging artist there, clearly, obviously, but a lot of um, peers, uh, people that I interact with, uh, and friends, that economics is, 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 is a factor, uh, scale and economy, and sort of access, um, that the evidence of the hand, um, there's an immediacy of, of abstraction, immediacy of, of of paint and, and, uh, and sculpture with just um, you know having this this uh, immediate means versus a highly finished, highly polished production that yeah. one needs uh, to have a lot of economic means to kind of uh, you know Alan McCollum style table and need a giant table of like you know six hundred of these works replicated uh, versus going to the hardware store and just getting some wood and, and canvas and going for it. Yeah. Um, I'm going to be really awkward, and I just wonder whether before we discuss the discussion, okay. the theme, I wonder, it, it's like if we could define some terms first. Okay. Um, yeah. So, um, the title is Abstract Revival. Yeah. Okay. So, I just wonder whether we could sort of have a bit of a conversation first, what, what we mean by abstract, mm -hmm. and, what, and what we mean okay. by revival. Yeah. I mean, what evidence do we have? For this revival, and 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 firstly, um, do we mean the same thing when we say abstract? Right. Because um, yeah, there's kind of like brand abstraction, which is kind of like uh, things that look like famous uh, sort of greatest hits of abstraction, mm -hmm. and then yeah. this uh, yeah. abstraction in the sense of people who still believe that it's possible to you know, abstract shapes from reality and make them into canvas, you know. So, um, so, so, you know, what do we mean by abstraction or what, or what were you thinking of when uh, um, you thought of abstraction? Slide, what well, what I do think you mean? Next slide. There you go. Because we've been working with, this is one of um, Enrico's artists, Paul Simons, mm. um, and then the next one, mm. And these are both in our stand at the moment, and this is Guillermo Carrion. Okay. Um, I think I was thinking about abstract painting in these kinds of terms, sense right. of material, um, colour, I think, um, you know, the human touch, you know, the artist's hand, the idea mm. of craft, um, and also something that we've been talking about is um, the sense of scale as well, that kind mm. of, compared to maybe kind of abstract painting in the past which was kind of maybe grander scale we've, mm. we've noticed a lot of kind of small intimate paintings mm. okay I think I'm thinking based on the conversations that we were having um, sort of these the the work that I see the work that I encounter um, certainly in New York and I've seen a lot of it here actually it seems to be less um, and this could be wrong this mm. in a Horrible reduction, horrible generalization that this is sort of how these things go, right? So, generally speaking, there seems to be a fluidity with engaging in this as a language versus uh, this term that you came up with, um, with this term that you used, the sort of landmark, where the, the Abex, you know, reading it historically, it seemed very focused on uh, breakthroughs and landmarks in the next mm -hmm. chapter, sort of almost science based, like what's the, what's the next development going to be? This the work that I encounter seems less interested in that, and the artists that I, that making a breakthrough and changing the dialogue or the yeah. dynamic, but yeah. rather having a conversation within an established 
uh, yeah. and within established parameters, engaging in abstraction as yeah. a language, and a language that's sort of understood, mm. it, it, by implication it's just assumed, it's a given that it is an understood yeah, exactly. language. And that we can, kind of established language already. We can employ and use or, or, mm. or discard at, at the ready, so mm. maybe that's a marker of of um, post, you know, sort of a post postmodern mm. sort of place of you know sampling and taking and, and calling from and having license with or feeling liberty to. Mm. But, okay. yeah. Because for me, this 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 three types of or three tendencies uh, for for the idea. Well, there's probably more, but I mean, I can think of three uh, at the moment. Uh, there's three tendencies for types of abstraction. Uh, or types of sort of like you know camps for abstraction at the moment. Um, so uh, whether there's a revival for each one of those is another question. But mm. the first three that I can think of is, for example, this would be number one, which is uh, from what you described. It's almost like uh, the idea of abstraction um, in terms of uh, its sort of pure beliefs. They've been distilled and passed on through generations, and there's this idea that. You know, an artist can still make this this works. You know, which yeah. obviously they yeah. they have done. Yeah, because they're outside in your yeah. stand. So, uh, but this uh, this idea that it's sort of non non referential abstraction, um, as opposed to sort of figurative uh, works, um, and and it's and it's their works, it's, it's their paintings. You know, so the, the second sort of um, uh, front is what's been referred to these days. Uh, I don't know whether you've heard of it, but something called uh, a zombie formalism. Mm -hmm. So that's yes. kind of um, that's that's not these people. It's right. you know, zombie formalism. It's more like they they mix and match. You know, they you know, it's, it's a bit like fashion where they say you get the, the, the sort of the jacket of a, of a mod and the shoes of a uh, whatever sort of biker, and you, know, you mix and match. And it, it it doesn't really matter that things don't really match. The so zombie formalism adopts. The style of uh, certain artists in the past, primarily abstract artists, yeah. but they don't align themselves with those values, you know. So they kind of they're different to these guys. And then the, the third sort of type would be um, the abstract paintings that uh, still remain in, in museums, you know, the kind of like yeah. the sort of original sort of yeah. generation of yeah. those sort of paintings that are cracking up or warping or whatever and selling for lots of money, you know. Yeah. So in, in a sense, all those. For me, all those different camps represent different conversations about abstraction, and uh, by by default, they're all having different sort of revivals. You know, so for example, the revival of John Hoyland's work yeah. is yeah. due to very specific reasons, like you say, David Hurst, which is different to perhaps this kind of revival yeah. that you know we see. But here. I think also there's been a kind of shift in. How abstract painting is received, I think, maybe a bit more like what you were saying, Enrico. It's kind of, um, I don't think any more people kind of criticize this and, and, and what is it? I think kind of the wider public already kind of accept that, you know, abstract painting do, is. Do you mean wider public as in um, people go to go to IKEA and now may buy an abstract poster, or do you mean? What a public as in uh, institutions, uh, other artists. Uh. Yeah, I, well, I think I meant more. Yeah, kind of. For mm. example, the people that go, you know, they're not engaged enough, but they go to the Tate or they go to the big museums. Mm. Um, I think that in the past there mm. was kind of more, you know, people wouldn't accept it, but now it's kind of. Mm. I think, and being a painter, I've, I feel that. You know, I can do abstract paintings, and mm. people aren't. They don't question it. Mm. I, I guess they would have done in the past. Yeah, can I do for a second? Yeah, certainly. Um, what strikes me about in abstract revival we're talking about, I find personally that um, things are very different according to where you are geographically. Mm. Right. Um, as I was talking, it bothers me. From where I was standing, because I've now captured that I think in New York it's not really a revival. I don't think abstract painting has ever really gone away mm, since right. the Abbott's movement. It's, it's something, for me, a huge relief, I 
actually when yeah. I started engaging with an American colleague mm. to realise that I didn't have to in any way explain or justify abstract painting or even yeah. painting yeah. as I sometimes yeah. had to yeah, yeah. in Europe. Um, whereas in England, I don't even feel it's a revival in the sense that I think it's, I mean, there, there, have, there was that movement, it was people like John Hoyland, but I don't think they're being really recognised now. I think they barely were. I think abstract right. painting, it's only now in England that it is being accepted as, as something something valid. Um, mm. English, British painting has always, I mean, the modernist movements didn't really happen here in the same way, but they were a step behind in terms of all the isms, and then sort of incorporated them en masse, and didn't necessarily go to the motions of abstract painting in the same way, apart from, um, we didn't talk about that other camp or strand, which is more hardline geometric abstraction. Mm. Of course, we have people like Richard Riley, who's mm. almost one art in England, um, but I, I feel that English British painting has now been almost undeniably narrative to some extent. And the great names over here in the 50s and 60s really, I'm getting that spy school, which was something a bit apart. People like Heron and those guys who were knocking around with Boyland yeah, as well. Yeah. I, I don't feel it's a revival in England, I feel it's, it's more An finally. Acceptance. Yeah. And I, but I also feel like there's a pair of sort of dark grassroots movement of, of um, something like this with artists curating more and more and the fact that painters amongst themselves have always had that support and understanding mm. of that kind of work but it's only now that it's crossing over in England yeah. to my mind. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, 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 I agree with what Aaron's saying that uh, I think that um, it's like I'm sure that somewhere um, somewhere in England right now there's probably like 10,000 sort of musicians playing Stairway to Heaven or trying to learn Stairway to yeah. Heaven. Uh, yeah, it, it doesn't mean that uh, people trying to play instruments is no longer valid, but the tendency is that the people don't play instruments in order that they buy more, whatever. So likewise, there, there are people I'm sure sort of making large paintings uh, which are uh, and, and have been for a long time, sort of, you know. Um, yeah. But perhaps more in the sort of like, uh, sort of late 80s, uh, when Spectrum oil colour seemed to be sort of funding most art schools. But, uh, you know, ev eventually, uh, perhaps the emphasis shifts, uh, other things come along, but it doesn't mean that those people stop making work. However, what's happened in, in the last few years, I'm not quite sure why, um, and, and that's why I'm slightly suspicious about trying to say that there is a sort of revival as such, mm. is that we've had a couple of major exhibitions in museums, um, such as, for example, Malevich's yeah. uh, sort of yeah. uh, yeah. paintings that uh, yeah. take modern, uh, you know, r roughly a hundred years after the first black square was painted. Yeah. You have this exhibition, uh, which it's it's great in that it coincides with a hundred years from this seminal work, but also um, coincides with uh, you know he, one of his black squares selling for. Uh, a million pounds around 2000, his fourth black square sold around a million pounds around the year 2000 and then in 2008 uh, Supremacist composition, I don't know, number seven or something, sold for 60 million dollars, you know, so yeah. uh, you know, you can imagine that suddenly maybe perhaps a museum board of trustees directs think, well maybe we should love an abstraction show, you know. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, you know, and other people start to think, yeah, I like abstraction. It's good. You know? <laughs> <laughs> this, you know, so it's like it's so pure, you know. So it's it's kind of tricky always to say that this because maybe it's never gone away, but we feel that that revival is yeah. there. But actually, it's uh, you know, it's because uh, we suddenly get a leaflet telling you there's going to be an abstract show, and um, <coughs> yeah. But I think so. Maybe I was thinking of kind of the choice of artists as well. Um, I mean, I study at the Slade and I try and go to the final shows every year mm. and there's always a, um, a strong painting tradition there at the Slade mm. but this, you know, the last couple of years I've really noticed mm. more abstract painting there than, than before mm. as opposed to media-based art or, mm. or performance art I think as a choice as well, people are, mm. you know But could that be because that's what you're looking for? As an abstract well, artist, well, yeah, absolutely. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. Um, 
Yeah, I can't, I don't, I want to jump in. I don't want to draw the, the conversation across the pond continually, because that's from which I, from, yeah, that's where I'm located, so. Um, but I would map to Pierre's point about um, artists emerging, um, graduating schools, uh, that I'm encountering. It seems certainly that maybe in the, in the 90s, um, uh, a lot of, uh, you know, where there was a lot of media, video performance mm -hmm. was maybe the thrust of maybe what, what I, what, again, these are generalizations, but this is what we, this is what we do, right, mm -hmm. this kind of thing. Um, where the, that was the thrust, that was the conversation, that was what was sort of garnering attention, mm -hmm. um, not just, you know, in the, in the university, but also in the institutions, that was what seemed to be getting airtime, right, or seemed to be getting floor space at some of the institutions. Um, in New York, well, that didn't. That's not to say painting went away ever, um, but that you know certainly in the periodicals and in the you know institutions, to my eye, it seemed that there was a lot of um, you know whether it was uh, you know I'm thinking just postmodern anything you know, um, and starting it with the early 2000s, and that's sort of when I landed in New York, and so this is it can't be that you know as a painter an abstract painter myself that I was geared toward that, but I began seeing these like. You know, uh, as I'm there, I'm, I'm noticing so many uh, mm. painters, so many sculptors that are engaged in abstraction as a language, as um, you know, versus the narrative, the performative, the the sort of storytelling. But this is the thing that I think is interesting. A lot of the abstract painting that I encounter seems to be telling its own story. If they're pulling from Frank Stella. That's part of their story. I'm interested in Frank Stella. Frank Stella speaks to me, and this is why. You know, here's my point. My point is that I'm engaging this language. This has something to do. Um, so I don't, you know, I feel like the story is still there, maybe, but being told in a different way. Well, I think, I think that in the States, it, it definitely, it's, it's always been there. Yeah. I mean, um, I'm worried because it's been recorded, so I don't want to say anything too controversial, but. Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, we, we have students uh, at Camberwell who go to, to exchanges in, in New York and they come back and they say, yeah, we did color studies, you know, and you can think, wow, this is like so reactionary, you know, like, so, you know they come back all doing squares and you say, like, you have to like sort of take the paint away from them because, and um, this idea that you do color studies, you know, it's like, uh, which is great, you know, it's great if you want to study colour, but just the way that it's been taught in a certain way. Mm -hmm. Or likewise, you know, went to the uh, Miami Art Fair sort of years ago, and, and you, you arrive and it, f it feels completely different, because you, you see all this, like, paint, stained canvases, and so you, you feel that it's something is being promoted, or, or being sort of um, pushed, you know, sort of, sort of uh, you know, because there's this a collector base, perhaps, that has already those paintings, so that's what they're wanting to... You know, so I think the geography, you know, has a lot to do with it, and I'm sure that if you go to different places, there's going to be different, different emphases. Places. And 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 I've and the more I've found about these things recently, the more I wouldn't say cynical that I've become, but I think the more um, informed that I've become. Yeah. So you hear of certain uh, works that are acquired by museums, uh, and, and 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 how that has an impact on. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. You know the, 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 the commercial sector because there's a kind of mutually reciprocal thing where uh, you know the, the, those those museums are, are wanting to sort of uh, push something forward so that they're wanting people to acquire this works etc. So it's not it's not it, it doesn't just happen. So these things like revival or for example or even because uh, there's two there's two pi points to the question here like you know, what, what we mean by abstraction and what we mean by revival. Mm. So as far as the revival aspect, I think it's it doesn't just happen like say like something that grew naturally, you know. Yeah. From, from, you know, I think it's been placed perhaps in a certain context so that there appears to be a revival. But in in essence, that that sense of the artist making those works is never really gone away. Gone away. I mean, even even, yeah. even um, Malevich said it when he was, um, I think, when he was uh, incarcerated in 1930. Uh, having been given the choice to, you know, stop painting, make figurative paintings, go to jail, he went to jail, and then six months later he said, you know what, I might do some figurative stuff, I don't mind. <laughs> you know? But he, you know, he did say, I think that art, art will continue without us. You know, art, art can, be. and I think that abstraction, uh, or in fact, you know, mo most of art making is a, a peculiar thing in that it has a sort of almost 
life of life its own and it, it will continue. Uh, but we tend to think that somehow we made those revivals happen when right. in fact they're slightly more uh, things sort of uh, manipulated by other forces, you know. Yeah, no, I think, I guess my kind of drive, I guess, like you say, I look for abstract painting because I'm an abstract mm. painter. Mm. Um, but also, yeah, as I say, the choices mm. that artists make, you know, people going back to paint and paintbrushes, mm. I think is, you know, there is something in the air as well. Mm. I think, I was thinking a lot about how, you know, with the digital age, mm. so much of what we do is kind of involved with typing mm. on keyboards and things, whereas kind of the tactile nature of mm. um, mark making, I think, is also, mm. you know, comes from that. Mm. Because, well, again, with, with this sort of um, trend for zombie formalism, which you'd be curious to know, uh, what what you've heard about it? Uh, in fact, it's the opposite. Where people, uh, one of the characteristics of it is that people aren't necessarily using brushes or, or even right. paint, but they're making paintings that have that appearance um, purposely, not using brushes or mm. Windsor and using palette knives or mm. etc. Um, so yes, yeah, so, so you know, if I hear if I hear. Um, Def Leppard on the radio, I kind of think, oh god, look, they're playing Def Leppard, but that's probably like the only time that they've played it in radio once, played it in six years, you know. So uh, I don't know, I'm not quite sure whether there is that sort of uh, I, I'm sort of, I guess I'm sort of trying to generate a, a discussion rather than all of us say, yes, yeah, so there's a lot of marks being made <laughs> today, yeah. you know. Yeah, yeah. You know, I'm not entirely sure whether that's necessarily um, what, what we mean here, you know. In a discussion like this, yeah. What do you think we mean? <laughs> I, I'd like to chime in on the zombie formalism um, bit because I think you know he said earlier that I feel like when an, the artists that I myself certainly, and then mm -hmm. other artists that I, I count among colleagues and peers, uh, generally speaking, to engage um, in the language of abstraction, or they're engaging in the language of figuration, um, or you know, narrative performance. Um, seem to be, especially with abstraction, seem to be telling their own stories. So this mm -hmm. idea of zombie formalism as a marker of, the, of an age where we are mm -hmm. sort of still in this DJ hip hop, we can pull, which is the start of DJ hip hop culture. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can listen to jazz musicians mm -hmm. in the 40s and you know, who are riffing on uh, you know, classics that came before. You know, but this idea of riffing, I feel, mm -hmm. you know, to be comfortable to, to call from whatever resources are at are within mm. arm's length, and to mm. have that liberty and agency. Maybe it's you know, um, I mean, I see it all over, and I'm interested mm. in it. And I think um, you know, without necessarily having to have the backdrop, having having have the the history, you know, or maybe having the history. Like I want to, I mm. want to reference Agnes Martin for a reason. I want those yeah. references. I want the references of Frank Stella. I want mm. um, you know the references of Def Leppard. I want to make sure that those lyrics or those strains. Mm because that adds to what I'm trying to sort of mm -hmm. say, that my own voice, it's my own mark, Tarantino style, I'm just gonna pull from whatever. Um, but um, in terms of, as a person who engages primarily with the language of abstraction mm -hmm. in a narrative way, mm -hmm. um, I, I think that it's a funny, the, 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 the zombie, the term zombie is maybe an unfortunate because that's something that's dead and has come to life and it's maybe mm -hmm. asleep or not at, the helm, but I see a lot mm. of if there is that purposeful mm. engaging and purposeful like employing of marker, it seems mm. purposeful. It seems there's, in my experience, it seems that there's an interest that there's there's been research or there's some point to it. Um, yeah, there's a a large piece hanging against the glass wall, just directly across by Sharon Butler, who's a blogger who writes a, a pretty popular blog in the states called Coats of Paint. And she came up, I think the term was, you'll correct me, Aaron, if I'm wrong, the, the new casualist. Yes. Right? This new casualist, too. You know, which is maybe also, you know, like a zombie formalism, you know, and she got a lot of press around this, you know. She got a lot of flack for it as well. A lot of people found it very objectionable as a term, and actually surprising that it was an artist who had 
Well, the term, like, this is what the implications are, right? Like, Casual, and this is sort yeah. of like formal. And deliberately unfinished or process mm. pieces. Right. This, this is really strange, actually, because about, I don't know, a few years ago, I, I, taught, I sort of made up a really bad joke, and the next thing you hear it on the radio, you think, God, how did that happen? You know, you know, maybe people can, you know, make up bad jokes in different types. Well, no, but, okay, but, it's a very but, red blog, so but the, I, I but I've actually sure. been, and, and, I'm, and I say it this time, actually, because it's been recorded, but I have been writing about exactly this um, idea of a new movement emerging. And uh, which which I took a complete claim for, uh, uh, and which I invented by by accident about um, 20 years ago. And what happened? You won't believe this. I phoned a gallery. I won't I won't I won't tell who the gallery is. So I, was, I just left St Martin's, and I was looking for a job, you know. And uh, and I kind of sort of and I phoned the gallery and I say, Do you have any casual work? And they go, eh, Well, uh, uh, we we got some landscapes. So I'm an abstract painting, very beautiful. <laughs> but no casual work, you know. And I said, oh, okay, thank you very much. And then I kind of went away. And every now and then, every so often, I would think, well, maybe there is such thing as casual work. And only about a month ago, I, st I decided to start writing down th this new thing that is emerging, which is because I think casual work, uh, casualism, is slightly different to zombie formalism, although um, for zombie formalism is like an antecedent in that it still has a relationship to, it still has an art historical relationship, but it sort of doesn't really care too much, but it still has a relationship. Well, I think a lot of painting now, in some ways, uh, because there is so much information, it's very difficult to actually bear, bear a connection, to, to make those intelligent connections. So it's now much more, um, you know, it's like a dress sports casual, you know, sort of make casual work. Um, uh, so, yes, yeah, so I think that those are the questions for me that uh, we would have to sort of look at in terms of, you know, how, how does abstraction fit in with that whole trend rather than the um, authorised view of like, you know, the, the artist's hand, the mark making. Uh, I think this, this slightly grayer arguments going yeah, on in yeah. terms of art practice yeah. and then there are other arguments going on in terms of the promotion of the validated type yeah. of abstraction yeah. which is being sold at auction houses so they're slightly two, two kind of different things yeah. you know, you know, I mean the, the irony is that for me uh, I mean first of all I, I, even though I make abstract paintings I wouldn't consider myself an abstract painter I wouldn't consider that that's my definition, you know, mm. of per se. But curiously, I would I would say, um, nonetheless, I think that um, everything is abstract. I've said this before. Everything is abstract, you know. So it's no coincidence that people make at some point abstract paintings, and and even even painting, I consider that all all painting is abstract. abstract. Yeah, yeah. If you look at a Velasquez painting, is 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 abstract. Yeah. You know, but it's it's your brain or cognition or yeah exactly uh, you know cultural whatever yeah. links that we're with that you, we, we give it shape and we give it narrative and yeah but he was his objective was to represent something I think more than yeah but it still doesn't doesn't make it any less abstract right that's a, that's a thing yeah. you know if uh, if if a if a dog came along they wouldn't uh, there, there, there isn't something about it which is universally uh, figurative, you know. Yeah. Uh, you know, I've, I, I've often sort of um, told this story sometimes when I was again speaking with students. Is that um, there was this, there were, you know, a, a visual language. It's a, it's a learned thing. It's a kind of. It's not a sort of. You're not necessarily born. You're born with the capacity to recognise faces, you know, uh, and that's that's quite undisputed. That there's a part of your brain that is able to recognise. Faces, but in terms of recognised pictures, it's a very different thing. Yeah. There's a story of, um, I think it was a vet in a remote region of the world uh, who had never seen a, a, a painting, but he'd seen animals, and yet when he was shown 
a picture of, of a horse, he couldn't actually see what was in front of him, even though he knew what a horse was like, because they had never been in a cognitive wiring to be able to recognize a, a picture plane or, or to recognize in it. it once, once I had somebody come and do some work in my house and they said, what is that? And, uh, and, I, and I said, well, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a painting of a house. And, and they said, oh, it's a painting, right? So they, they couldn't even right. recognize it as yeah, a painting. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So these, these notions of abstraction or uh, a, a geometric abstraction, uh, et cetera, et cetera, they're quite sort of sophisticated sort of concepts that, in a sense, people preserve, you know, that, that idea, you know. Yeah, I want to jump on what you said there because there's a, this idea of context and, you know, I feel like it's, it's language and so mm. for me, you know, if you're speaking a language that's understood, it, it only works if the other people around you are speaking mm. the same inflection notwithstanding or, 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 you know, sort of colloquialisms you still have to speak the same kind of language and this is understood. I had a, a, a builder come into my studio, which we had, my, myself and my business partner had a shared studio uh, with an art space in the front. He came through the art space and he was there on official business for the building and said, oh, this is great and began to like sort of knock against one of the paintings that was, was <laughs> on display. How much are these tiles? And that, mm. as a builder, and then he had not, he assumed that there were abstract works. He, and I, so I'm freaking out, like, don't, you know, like, you know, don't. But he's like, well, these are great tiles. How much is this here? You know, I'm like, it's not a tile, it's a thing. You know, but so, but this idea of context, so he's understanding it from his perspective. It's a very different thing. So he's speaking mm -hmm. a different language with regard to mm -hmm. this, still a piece, it's still something, it's still yeah. an object of value, it's a different value, mm -hmm. right? So, um, so I think that's an, an important thing, mm -hmm. context and, uh, that the conversation is really, it, you know, but that's, um, you know, you brought up a, I want to also bring in, because as I was listening to you talk about, um, talk about this, uh, the zombie formalism and uh, the work of, you know, the, whether it's casual or, or, mm -hmm. uh, or zombie formalist, for me, and I'm thinking of the Unmonumental show, um, you know, the Unmonumental Sculpture Show, where there's like sort of like this, you know, there's a lot of like this unfinished wood and like just sort of sculpture, and we're seeing this a lot, abstract, but we can, we can, we can identify these. I can go to the Home, de the home Depot and pick up, mm -hmm. you know, two by fours and material and screws sort of hanging off mm -hmm. things. There's, it's abstract, it, but it references building materials. Maybe that's the point of the artist, maybe the artist isn't engaging, uh, but that the artist has agency to sort mm -hmm. of say, um, you know, um, yeah, and so this, this point, you know, bringing up, you know, brought up Sharon Butler, and I think, you know, this is being recorded, hi Sharon, love you, um, you know, that I, I, I don't, I don't really have an opinion that of positive or negative with regard to how one employs abstraction or materials, um, listening to you talk about, or your point, you know, I'm thinking of the material and the tactile, that that actually is also uh, mm -hmm. as much as colors, as much as paint, the materials for, have always been part of the conversation, but mm -hmm. um, in my experience of late are foregrounded um, in our experience of, of a work that includes from everything from the, the stretcher bars to the canvas to, to all of so maybe that's always been the point, um, but I, would, I think I would have to agree with peers with the, the Velasquez, yes, it, all art is abstraction, right? It's always never. It's always not a pipe. This is not a pipe. Mm -hmm. Still, it's not a pipe. Yes, it is. No, it's not. So, um, but that the point, you know, the point of whether it's storytelling or the point is like pictorial illusion or the mechanics of how we see, um, that's you know, uh, I think what interests me. You know, and I, where I stand with regard to the abstraction that I encounter, mm -hmm. I think that. The number of artists, whether it's a story of expression, this is how I'm expressing mm. myself. This is how my hand feels like the need to move. This is an intuitive thing. It's not literally I'm telling you a story, but this is a piece of me. This is part of my larger story. I feel like we're still, I could be wrong about this, but I feel like we're still in the storytelling age versus an age where we're really about breaking through the mechanics and getting to the next chapter of like how we, you know, the mechanics of pictorial illusion and, and pictorial sort of visual experience. So I don't know. That's where I'm at. That's where I'm at. I don't know if that answers anything, but yeah. <laughs>
when a lot of people talk about non-representational painting being as a label. Um, coming back to Velasquez again, um, for me something like this, it's, he's quite aware that he's putting colours in different thicknesses on a canvas. Um, he is inspired by cities and so on, but you know he's essentially making something that doesn't really represent anything. Um, and that that's okay as well. He's not. He doesn't. So it's not questioning that. He's just doing it. Whereas I think before there was more of a questioning of, you know, um, is it okay to do this? You know, what does this mean? I think now this is my kind of point of view. Is that you've got to. I, I honestly don't think that any artist worth his or her salt has ever made a work and thought, is it alright for me to do this? If, if you, if you, you know, I don't, I mean, most of the greatest ideas are completely banal and stupid right. to begin with, and that's what makes them, um, that's what gives them a sort of valency. The fact that, you know, we, we're in a, this area where you're not quite sure whether, you know, can, can you imagine the, the, the first person who ate a lobster? Can you imagine the first black mm. square? Can you imagine the first Andy Warhol sort of screen? They're kind of, they're kind of wrong in a weird way, and uh, you know, and at the same time, they're they're beautiful things, and then they become accepted okay. perhaps by a sort of status quo. But I honestly don't think that, you know, I, I can't imagine Albacks, you know, sort of being in a studio for you know, three hundred and sixty-four days of the year, thinking like, oh, should I be doing something else? You know, do you see what I mean? Yeah, he's made, I think made he's, those. But I think he's made of, that kind of work, which you describe at the marks, whatever, okay. completely without sort of. But all the decisions that a painter is making, I think higher up. But again, I think this this is this is why sometimes it's like when people say, um, well, any conversation, and, and you know, somebody says, let's discuss X, but and, and you, if you fill the form, you'd probably realise that we all have different ideas of what X is. So when you say a, a painter or an artist, you know, I mean, for example. Um, the degree show at Goldsmiths this year of how many students graduating from the fine art had two painters. Mm -hmm. So obviously the slave mm -hmm. might have yeah. more painters and they might yeah. have more certain types of painters, but the whole of the Goldsmiths year there was only two from, there were two painters, right. you know. Right. And they were both abstract, no not really. <laughs> so um they been like Velasquez. <laughs> yeah, you watch Velasquez and almost like Mark making with their abstraction. No. Um, so yeah, so it, it depends a lot of these this questions are geographical, they're like, mm. um, you know, what, what, you know, e even the fact that we're here having this conversation today, as opposed yeah. to watching the rugby, means that we have a different sort of value system. Yeah, you know, that's, so that's an easy answer though. Why is that? Instead of watching the rugby. Is it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Ireland, yeah. Argentina, I think that's quite an important game. Yeah. Anyways. <laughs> Carry on. Yeah, I'm not. I like to watch the rugby, don't understand it, but I watch it anyway. Same thing as about the, the mark making um, process, something like this reminded me of, of a quote by um, Pierre Kevin, the Danish painter. Well, one point said quite simply that every painter today has to be aware that all painting is fundamentally about lies and trickery in some way. Right. We're aware of this when we're painting. I mean, we're naive enough in our days to be. <laughs> sure. To, um, that is a given. We agree with one here. <laughs> The fact that there's got to be a given attention anyway. Yeah. There's a point here. No, I was just going to mention there's a show in Leeds uh, this year called Painting in Time, which was Italian. And it was uh, about sort of expanded field of painting. And all of the painters in there were not, uh, apart from one who was using painting canvas, they were all definitely uh, working within a kind of exploded notion of what abstract. Um, and so there was sort of a sequined uh, shirt shaken in front of the strobe lights, mm -hmm. and that was claimed by the artists that they had a symposium. And all of them were, you know, calling it painting, were very, very keen to claim it as painting and as abstract painting. So I was wondering if you could say anything about the kind of different streams of an abstract revival within paint on a support and an abstract revival within this expanded field. Like, mm -hmm. I love it. Reflected light. Got it. It's great. You know? <laughs> Secret reflected light. I mean, because that's all colored, right? It's all reflected light. It's, it's 
That's great. Um, mm. I can't, uh, maybe you guys can, can speak to this, this idea. And I hate to belabor a point, but I'm thinking of, um, yeah, this, this idea of, um, you know, looking at the masters, like the, the, first, the first square, the first, um, and seeing that as masterful. I feel like where I would plant one of the flags, I've been plant many flags, one of the flags I would plant is in the mastery of, I don't want to use the word performance, but I'm going to use it anyway. Um, the way one can hear a musician perform Rhapsody in Blue, and that can be masterful. They might not have composed the piece, they might not have made the first black square, but their particular inflection, their particular, they're bringing their heart, they're bringing their soul, they're bringing their, their challenges, they're bringing their, their context and, and their movements through to that particular piece in that moment in you as a listener, right? So there's this larger thing that's happening that that can be masterful and that, that, that it's, it's completely aside from the idea of like the landmark composition and breaking through something and having like sort of existing in the the, the, the textbook says the first, the first black square, the first, um, you know, stained uh, canvas. Um, and the, again, generalizations, apologies, but the predominant number of artists that I encounter, myself included, is really moving in that area of, for lack of a better word, performance, like engaging in a language and not feeling having to rewrite the language, but sort of a sense of ease and comfort with, with with existing within that. Yeah. Um, again, that's, I'm sure that I'm stepping on tons of toes with that, but you know, um, yeah, you, you generally kind of, speaking. You kind of inherit a lot of stuff, you know, like um, a lot of stuff already exists before you kind of, uh, you know, by, by, by the time you go to art school, you know, you've probably seen a lot of stuff which has already been made since the, you know, cave paintings to present day. Uh, but I think, I think, yeah, to to answer the question a little bit, uh, what's happened in the last few years is with, particularly with abstraction, is similar to what happened, uh, and maybe you can sort of correct me here, but it, 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 what happened with uh, figurative painting in New York, uh, say in the um, uh, in the eighties, where there was a kind of like a revival of uh, expre expressionism in painting. But it was all the people who, because all the teachers had been into video performance and land art, every time somebody went, "Hey, I want to, you know, do a bit of charts," and I don't, but I don't know where to get it from. You know? So they just kind of went and did it themselves, and uh, so it ends up looking at it like, kind of thing. So we call that neo-expressionism, and you got like Basquiat, for example, like one of the right. f first and you know foremost exponents of that. And I think in some ways something similar is happening with abstraction in that, uh, you know, it's not. On the whole, you know, it's not like um, it's not like a sort of cool genre. On the whole, generalizing, you know, so um, so if you kind of make an abstract painting, that chances are that you know there ha there haven't been as many people around who, who will say, um, yeah, you know, you should really look at sort of uh, so and so Agnes Martin or something, or you should look at, you know, so so again, people, you know, they want to try things, they want to make things. But you know um, they, they've, they're coming from from a different angle. You know they're not sort of thinking. You know so so what's what's being passed on isn't necessarily the kind of value system that you know we can because for a long time abstraction adhered itself to a kind of value system from you know from uh, constructivism to you know the still to sort of. Um, you know, uh, post painted abstraction, sort of Colourfield, Bar Barnum, Newman, all these people. It's always that there's been some degree of kind of uh, this baton being passed on to the next generation, and that's the kind of abstract painter that emerges, etc. But uh, something happens at some point whereby it, it doesn't have the same uh, place within society, yet people still carry on making abstract paintings. But the value systems haven't been passed on in the same way. So uh, this kind of like idea for a sort of um, uh, utopian society, which at one point, say, uh, you know, Mondrian was thinking about, isn't really the kind of abstraction um, that is being made now. Although somebody might use the same pattern because they saw it in a shampoo bottle yeah. that mm. decided to use, you know, uh, salon selective style. Mondrian-esque um, patterns 
because they're cool, because they're modern, and yeah. then somebody picks them up without realizing that this is an artist, Pierre Bondrian, who who actually first came up with those ideas. You know, so uh, so yes, yeah, so expanded painting is is it's a little bit like uh, zombie formalism. Uh, so, so the line goes is that you have like expanded painting, some before formalism, and now casual work as the uh, sort of uh, evolution of this kind of painting. Uh, and expanded painting was almost like the, 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 the first instance of this idea of you know, how to make a painting um, that loosely, you know, it wasn't figurative, that was the main thing, it wasn't figurative. And it could be like that you find a say a set of cur some curtains, and you thought put them on a stretcher, so you know you've, you've made a painting. And and also another thing which is very popular with expanded painting is often it's got a it's got a hole in the middle, you know. So it's like you know because it's the one thing that you don't do with you know with a painting, so you put something missing in the middle. So uh, there's many approaches you know, that have sort of since uh, developed, which all fall under this sort of. Uh, an, an abstraction in the way that we're talking about it's probably just like a, a corner of this greater sort of uh, spectrum of what's being referred to as ex, you know expanded sort of painting. I yeah. think. I'm also really interested in how kind of you know I'm obsessed with how the internet has changed everything, completely yeah. changed everything, and how maybe that comes through in these kinds of works. Um, how, I don't know, people are moving around the world a lot more um, with this, this has completely changed our lives and, and so abstract, abstraction as a kind of a language for today as well, mm. I think a lot about. Well, uh, you know, again, um, um, you know, with, without sort of keep sort of quoting a lot of the students that I meet this day, um, you know, without kind of uh, Point, pointing a finger, blames them. The, the internet is so vast, and the the kind of the element of the screen homogenizing everything. It's so uh, quintessential that um, I mean, I get so many students now saying things like, uh, "I love the texture in Glenn Brown's work," you know. And you kind of think, "Have you ever seen it?" And I said, I right. said no. yeah. "So, but they've seen it on a computer, yeah, or, yeah. or they show me pictures of Frank Stella and say, I love Jim Lambie.' You know, you go, okay. <laughs> and you kind of think, like, uh, click again, click again. Oh, right, it's not. It's not. It's yeah, Frank. Yeah. So uh, there's, a, there's a great deal of confusion that's happening. And, and I actually don't mean that as a sort of as a value judgment thing. Like it's we're so confused, and it, it's just inevitable that you know there's there's so much of it. And I think that if anything. Um, it, it might it might generate a kind of you know uh, this sort of new breed of art will come from from that kind of yeah, yeah. Uh, confusion. Well, I was looking just last night looking for images of, on the Tate website, mm. and you know you spend half an hour there and you can go through the whole history of of modern art really. And it's just I think also that mm. is really I think well it has to feed into this I think nowadays that we've got access to. To pretty much everything in pictorial terms, you know. I liked your your point of, and I think this speaks to um, this idea of the internet and the information and what we have access to. But I I love this notion of expanded painting mm -hmm. um, in terms of maybe this is just where I come, where sort of where I come from, not geographically, but just sort of mm -hmm. um, with my interests in terms of rule breaking, um, in terms of expanding parameters of, of what's understood to be accepted um, accepted form, accepted uh, as a reaction maybe to, to mm -hmm. the modernist canon. Like this is how one's to be. We have extreme consideration to this and material, blah, blah, blah. You're supposed to do research. So I love this idea of, because mm -hmm. um, I, think, I think arts education is, is generally very influential in how we mm -hmm. encounter in our early training and how sort of we're formed and what our interests mm -hmm. are. But this idea of reacting against, um, you know, this idea of reacting against what came before, mm -hmm. and that's always, right, that's always throughout art history, where, you know, there's this dialogue or this pendulum swing, you know, where we're changing things, you know. Um, so, yeah, so I, for one, I'm, I'm, I'm really, uh, I am for, I think that's good news, that, you know, if we, uh, that the rules keep being broken and that the, the parameters keep being stretched, 
Um, mm. I think that's good news for art. I think that's good. Maybe in a way we're still, you know, sort of like, I'm not my dad. So we're reacting mm. to, you know, not my dad has a lot of my dad in it, right? Yeah. So by, by default, you know, but, mm. but so, you know, but that, I think that's still good news, like along the way of finding who I am with, mm. with, uh, with one's own voice. So, um, mm. you know, if, if the employing of, of abstraction as a language can, can help that, and then one finds that that's where they're, they're at or that moves them toward figuration and they say, well, I'm, mm. I'm actually an plain air painter. Who would have, who would have thunk? Mm. I didn't know that in, in uni, but here I am, you know, years later. Um, we've been talking for an hour, so I don't know if we should ask questions or... Does anyone have points or perspective? Or reflections? Or yeah. Uh, I, um, I, was, I was thinking about um, the exhibition that I saw over the summer at um, St. Paul's. Uh, it wasn't an abstract exhibition, it was a figurative painting exhibition. Mm. Um, and so, unfortunately, I can't remember many of the answers in the exhibition. Um, but it was this idea of revival that seems quite important to the theme. Um, a lot of the artists were um, uh, sort of, I suppose, might have been practicing in the 1970s and 80s. Uh, and these, these works were quite being revived by Stady Coles. Um, I thought it was interesting, I thought it was an interesting exhibition, uh, almost in sort of, and I, I, think, I think you're right that there is a kind of tendency, perhaps in the last sort of, I don't know, five years, for abstract, abstract painting, I can't quite put my finger on, on what that is, I think it's just a, a kind of an accumulation of seeing, you know, perhaps more abstract painting than figurative painting, yeah. but then it seemed like, kind of, uh, you know, th this particular gallery was kind of making um, an intervention into that kind of tendency, mm -hmm. um, you know, and it kind of stood out um, as, as being quite a refreshing exhibition. Mm -hmm. But it was, I mean, it didn't have any kind of, you know, critical rigor behind, you know, the idea. It just kind of seemed like, um, you know, it was, it was, it was almost like a kind of fashion statement. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So. Um, yeah, I mean, that was, I think this idea of revival, mm. you know, is in the kind of, it's also a question of fashion, yeah? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, I feel like it, it, it frees this part of me. There's a lot of very clean abstract painting mm. um, in a way that seemed pretty fashionable. I mean, That's a hard edge, very, kind of. Yeah, yeah, some some of those seem very good, but some of it was edging over into, especially because obviously of the like, buying audience yeah. out there, a lot of it was this will look good on your massive wall. Yeah. Um, so yeah, yeah. It was interesting to see that as a, I was expecting more video, more performance, but actually, obviously, the content of that as a commercial selling show, it makes sense. So I should make it very sellable still. Yes. Yeah. It's an interesting. I don't. I don't know if I see that as an unfortunate <laughs> aspect of it. You know? Yeah. <laughs> but I think it's it's an interesting that it's this this intersection of you know commodity and and, and us you know we as producers of that. You know? Yeah. It's a, it's an interesting. Uh, I was, I was saying, like what you're saying about obviously smartphones all around the internet. Um, it's it owns two or three, which is a great thing as well. Of course, it has, I mean, in many ways, what I was saying, like the beginning about the geographic differences. That's one of the things that's disappearing today. Yeah. Uh, in the sense that today it is global, um, and just at the markets level as well. Of course, yeah. the markets are another very good, yeah. important point that every in the beginning in the economy is there. Where I say it's a two-way street. Of course, we are all now able to see what's going on out there immediately from our own home, but we're also able to be seen. Yeah. Um, and yeah. that also is something that changes. Is I don't know whether there's more abstract painting being done in today, so we'll it's getting more of an op the opportunity to be shown yeah. elsewhere and to be bought elsewhere. I myself have no representation in England right now. I can sell the others in the US. Um, the fact that it you know, does go both ways, the fact that I felt that I was very much on my own painting or abstract painting in France for the years ago. You know, that, that's all globalized today. That's yeah. um, all shifting. Yeah. But I also, personally, I feel there's a deeper philosophical, <coughs> sociological context to everything we can say, which is the, 
not quite the notion that Anthony goes, but I feel that the sense there was 30 or 40 years ago of, of society, of philosophy, heading towards a has been yeah. blown apart yeah. in recent years. Yeah. I don't think anybody yeah. in their very way believes that we are progressive, the notion of progress, of evolution going to a better mm. place. Yeah. And the fact that when that is blown apart, what we are most of us left with is how to deal one to one with this life we're given, and the fact that many people are finding pure pleasure in not making the abstract of these. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, as I say, that the thing about yeah, not going one way, but just picking things from everywhere, I find that's really you know, um, something that I find myself thinking about a lot, kind of when I'm working. You know, and we're even talking about this kind of thing is abstraction, abstract paintings like this um, are kind of an international language as well, which. I'm sure is somehow connected to the fact that we are all in interconnected. Um, you know, these kind of references that he was making, I think a lot of people can pick up on. Um, I don't know, I just think it's kind of a reflection of, you know, this is not, mm, it's an open picture to a lot of different cultures. And I think it's kind of a, maybe aware of Instagram and he's going to put it up on Instagram, but he knows that people in Japan or Russia are going to look at it. I feel like the lines of why are you say everything's abstract and say nothing's abstract. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Any final words? For me, final words. Um, if I would go down the list, I guess, uh, to some um, I, I guess I was thinking that. Uh, Rather than being, for me, a final words, which is something I didn't um, get a chance to say, is that sort of considering this as a context and sort of considering if, if all of you are artists or artists who are also showing the work of other artists or, or have engaged in, in, in curating other people's shows and, um, and dip into art writing as well as being um, an artist. This as a context is, a, is where artists being made, where so many of us are makers here, whether it's, you know, we're making our educational plans or we're, we're making the sculpture, we're making the performance on the second floor, uh, which is brilliant, um, uh, or the videos on, on the fifth floor. I think that this, um, how does this tie to abstraction? Well, I think that the tie-in is sort of with this idea of expanded and rule-breaking, and I guess with agency, I guess, again, um, I've said this point, this storytelling point, but not to make it necessarily narrative, but one's own story, one's own, I think it's an exciting context to exist in. Like if I'm engaging in figuration or performance or abstraction, that I'm engaging for my own purpose, my own point. This has a lot to do with Instagram and with, with being seen. It's my YouTube channel. I get to put what the hell I want on. You know, it's my Instagram, it's my piece of canvas, or it's my scrap of wood, and I'm going to do, you know, this sort of empowering, I think is very exciting. Um, and, I, you know, I think there are rules that are broken, and that there are things that are maybe misinterpreted, or um, you know, you know, this idea of like not being uh, respect res respect worthy. I think is out there. Like we're not respecting our own history, but I truly think it comes at all. So my hope and my what I've seen is it also just settles. You know, I think that we're all on our own trajectory. So mm -hmm. yeah, that's my understanding of Sluice. That's my experience of Sluice anyway. Uh, being amongst the makers. Mm -hmm. uh, my final words, I'm gonna uh, simply mention three, three artists, uh, three significant artists uh, who are all still alive. Uh, well, first one, I've already talked about Frank Auerbach, uh, probably one of the single most living British artists at the moment. Uh, and it, it wasn't um, a joke when I was saying, you know, he, he's in the studio literally 364 days a year. Mm. He hasn't stopped making work for the last however many, many years, and he has sitters that have been coming to him for 30, 40 years uh, to, to pose for him. Uh, yet he's never really been fashionable. You know, he, he has had a lot. Of, he's had a lot of followers. You know, Fra uh, Frank Abbott's had a lot of followers, but he's never been fashionable. You know, so um, it, it doesn't mean that he's. Uh, now having a revival, you know, it's just yeah. you know, how it is. So that's yeah. kind of number one. Second one is um, 
Venezuelan-born artist called Carlos Crustiés, mm. uh, maestro as we refer to him. Mm. He's just turned 91 and uh, he's uh, building his new studio, you know, because he's looking to the future, you know. So, um, again, it tells us, you know, it tells us yeah. that uh, yeah. th these kind of notions of uh, past and future, you know, with, with some of him are um, immaterial, you know, he has uh, he has plans for the future, you know, and, and the th last artist I'll mention is uh, Carmen Herrera, 100, not out. And uh, <laughs> she started selling her work in her 80s. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. there's hope for us. <laughs> yeah. Okay, great. Fair, fair, fair. Um, well, thank you everybody for taking the time to come and visit. And thank you Enrico and thank you Juan. Um, thank you, Pierre. Pleasure. Thank you, yes. yeah. Pleasure. I, I did the least talking. But um, so, thank you. Thank you.